So in my work with the Iowa tribe of Kansas and Nebraska, um, when I think about agroecology in our context, I mean, one of the first things that I think of is how that terminology um, isn't used necessarily, but a lot of the principles and underlying ethics of it are. Um, and I think that's in part because agroecology is in some ways just a, a reframing or a re um, articulation of things that, that my community has always done. Um, so if we're talking about social dimensions of, of, of farm work and things like that, I mean, those are, of course, parts of how we've always considered our roles and our relationships to land. Um, and so in that way, like, I appreciate conversations like this that, that one, provide that sort of, you know, maybe a um, intellectual framing for that work in a way. And I also, especially for this gathering, appreciate that there is that openness to, to think about ways in which we can surface um, these knowledge systems and ways of being that, that predate the use of the term and the need for that term um, to the extent that that can be taken up by the full agriculture agroecology movement I think can um, you know inf inform and, and essentially make the work richer because for me when I think about co-creation of knowledge um, I'm thinking about not just our human, human to human co-creation, but, but especially how is, you know, these oak trees right here, how are we co-creating with them? Or maybe more appropriately, how are we following the lead of the things that the oaks in this uh, landscape um, provides to us? And so for, so for me, like, there's that need for like, within that is that understanding, appreciation for humility and, and acknowledging that in all the good work that we're doing in our respective communities, um, one of the key stakeholders that needs to be front and centered all the time is that biodiversity itself. And not just for how it might benefit us as humans, but how it can exist for its own being to, to nourish its own families in the ways that it, um, that it has been doing long before humans might have uh, considered them utility or utilitarian to us and our needs. And so for me, if we're talking about an agroecology of a future, one that kind of is inclusive of um, all their perspectives that predate agroecology, especially those that don't utilize that as a term because it's just a way of being, a way of doing. They recognize all the multiple dimensions of any system, especially in this case, a food and agroecology system. Um, then I think that we'll be, we'll be better suited to address the challenges that we face um, with, that, with that degree of humility to know that to our extent, whatever extent possible as humans, if we can support the well-being of all the biodiversity around us, all those other relatives, um, not just for our own purpose, but for their own health, for their own beings, their own communities, then we can start getting somewhere in terms of addressing all the health disparities and, and things that we can be, be working towards as a broader agroecology movement. And I was just remembering a friend of mine this morning, his name's Roger Fernandez. He's a Lower Elwha Sklalem um, storyteller. And what he talks about with the power of story is that it's that necessary complement to science um, because science can as he says it can tell us you know, how far away the sun is it can tell us how hot it is it can tell us when it's going to burn out but it can't tell us why the sun is and what is the meaning of the sun and so so through that act of storytelling making meaning in that way um, it is that necessary complement to the sort of intellectualized piece that science offers because um, which is very good for our minds um, but without the story, like we don't have also that intelligence coming from our heart and from our spirit. And without that part, like we don't have everything, all the parts that are needed to effectively move anything forward.